Welcome everybody to a new YouTube live talk organized by the Atlas Experiment at CERN. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Dilia Portillo. I am a postdoctoral researcher from the Triumph Laboratory and I am a member of the Atlas Collaborations and today I will be your host. Uh, this is a live talk with live Q&A session. So be sure that you ask all the questions you want. It can be in YouTube, here in the chat, or we can also look at Instagram. So please free, feel free to pass on as many questions as you want. Um, yes, this is a series of lectures. This is the 13th in our series. So you can go and check out our YouTube playlist to check them all. And at the end of this live, this talk will join the playlist so you can come back and watch this video as many times as you want. And okay, now, so let's present our speakers. We have today Dr. Martin Rybar and Dr. Peter Steinberg. Uh, hey, thank you. Thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, okay, for uh, Dr. Martin Reiber, he is a research scientist as Char at Charles University in Prague. He has been a member of Atlas Collaborations since 2009, and he is now convener of the Atlas Heavy Ion Physics Group. Then we have also Dr. Peter Steinberg. He is a senior scientist at Brookhaven Laboratory, well, Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York, and he has been part of the Atlas Heavy Ion Program since 2006. He is the former convener of the Heavy Ion Physics Group, and he is currently a deputy project leader for the Atlas C D detector, which you will be hearing more about. So yes, so let's go ahead and thank you for coming and the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation and for uh, all the all the listeners. Uh, so uh, today we are going to talk about uh, the heavy ion physics. So you might know the LHC usually collide uh, protons, but then uh, typically for like a few uh, weeks uh, per year, uh, we switch to collision of uh, lead ions, and we'll be talking about uh, about this about that. Uh, so uh, let me share our our slides that that we have. Um, okay. Okay. So uh, maybe before we will go and and discuss uh, like uh, uh, why we do these collisions of uh, of uh, heavy ions and what's the difference and how uh, with respect to these proton proton collisions and how we uh, organize uh, this whole data taking, we'll start with maybe something a uh, bit more simple, and that's like we will look like what is the matter made of the the the, the matter around us because that's. This is the motivation, actually, why we do all these collisions at the LIC to understand you know, the forces in the nature and the uh, the matter, what is it made of. And we'll start with something relatively big for us, but maybe relatively small for you, and that's a molecule. So the molecule, the size of the molecule uh, here on the picture on the left, it's like a molecule of water. It's something like a 10 to the minus 9 of meter. So it's like a 1 billionth of meter. Uh, you all know that the molecule is made of uh, atoms. Uh, atoms are a bit smaller than the molecule, maybe like a factor, uh, factor of 10. And what is interesting is that uh, the atoms, and it means that the matter around us, is almost like an empty, because the, the atoms uh, are made of uh, nuclei uh, and the, the electrons. Uh, uh, but all the, all the mass is actually almost carried uh, only by the nuclei that are in the center of the atoms. And they are very, very, very small. They are... 10 times smaller than the size of the atom. So really like the, the atoms, the molecule and everything, it's almost like an empty space because these nuclei are very small. The nuclei, you also probably know that uh, they are made of uh, nucleons, uh, protons and, and neutrons. Protons are charged, uh, neutrons are, are neutral. Uh, and they are like, a, again, like a factor of 10 times smaller than like a typical, uh, typical nuclei. And actually, since uh, mid twentieth century, we know that these nucleons are not an elementary particles; that they have some internal structure. And now we know that they are made of, of quarks that are uh, binded together uh, with a strong force. And we actually don't know how big are these quarks. We just 
we can put some some limit on the size. Similarly, we don't know how, how big is the electron. We can just put some limit uh, on the size of the of the electron. And actually, how we know this, how we how we know what is the size of the of the object. And actually, for that, we built accelerators because the accelerators they serve as a huge microscope. So, that, so that's one reason why we built uh, accelerators. The second reason is that we can use this like a famous Einstein formula: the E is mc square. And we can turn energy into matter. So when we collide protons or ions at the LAC, we take this like a huge kinetic uh, energy of these of these protons. We smash them, and we can create like a new particles, and we can study them. But then there is like a, a third reason why we collide things at the LAC, and that's we can create extreme temperatures in these collisions. And that's what is this heavy ion physics uh, about. Because when we create actually not protons, but heavy ions, at the LHC we collide a lead ions, we create an extremely hot and dense matter that we call a quark gluon plasma. Basically, we take all these protons and neutrons, we smash them, and we melt them, and we create like a soup of these like a free quarks and, and gluons that are normally binded inside these, these nucleons. And the temperature of this soup is extreme. I mean, you can see the the temperature on the slide in terms of the mega electron volts is energy or kelvins. All these these numbers will not tell you much. Uh, to have some comparison, that the temperatures that we are able to create in these collisions they are more than one hundred times higher than what is in the core of the sun, and we actually create conditions that are very similar that existed in our universe microseconds after the big bang so in principle what we what we are doing here are like a small big banks and we recreate the conditions existed uh shortly after the big bang there is some connection for example uh to the uh, to the cosmology and so so far i have talked about the accelerators so accelerators they are uh they are used uh, for accelerating and and smashing uh these protons or or ions but then we need to detect what is created in these in these collisions, and for that we build acceler uh, sorry we build detectors, huge detectors. And uh, me and Peter, we are uh, part of the Atlas collaboration, as it was mentioned at the, the, the beginning, uh, which is one of these like a big four detectors uh, at the LHC. It's a it's a it's a shape. It's a, it's a cylinder. It is uh, approximately forty six meter long. Uh, diameter is twenty five meters. And it weighs 7,000 ton. And you can really imagine it's a huge camera that's able to make, uh, make uh, 40 million shots, pictures uh, per, uh, per second. We'll discuss this uh, detector a bit, bit more and we'll focus on some, some, some parts that are relevant for the, uh, for the heavy ion physics. Here you can see a typical picture of, uh, from the heavy ion collision. This is, uh, this is a picture from a collision that we took uh, last year. We had like a very short short run just to test the to, to test our detector and to see it, uh, to uh, take a look at a couple of these collisions. What you can see is on the left, uh, you can see uh, all these uh, uh, colored uh, objects. This is typically represents like the energy that is uh, deposited uh, in the in the detector. Uh, on the on the right side, what you can nicely see is that the detector, if you cut it, it looks like an anion. So there are like a layers. So the inner part of the detector, it uh, uh, it meant to detect uh, particles. So all these uh, orange lines that you can see, these are like thousands of particles that are created in heavy ion collisions. And then these outer parts, this like a green and uh, and yellowish uh, boxes, uh, this indicates uh, how much energy is deposited in different direction. In the in the detector, so this is this is all coming from a single collision. So when you smash the two ions, you can create uh, up to uh, up to a few thousand of of other other particles. And sometimes you can create some special particle like like the the red one here. This this red line, which is called a muon. It's a, like a heavy brother uh, of of electron. And we are, for example, interested in in such events. Uh, we can also compare actually the lead lead collisions to proton proton collisions. So on the left, you can see again it's a, it's a slice through the detector in typical heavy ion lead lead collision. On the right side, you can see the proton proton collision, and you can see that there is typically an order of difference in number of particles that are that are produced. So in heavy ions, it's thousands of particles in PP, tens or up to hundreds uh, of uh, of particles. 
It also means that uh, when we have uh, when we try to reconstruct these these objects and understand them, we typically have to have uh, like a spe specific algorithms to deal with this like a very dense uh, very dense uh, environment. Okay, now I'm going to jump in here for a second, and I'd like to talk about the geometry of heavy ion collision. It's a very strange thing to think about geometry on a subatomic scale. But it turns out that when we think of nuclei, when Mar and Martin showed you that nuclei are, are, are actually quite a lot larger than nucleons and the protons that we collide in the LHC, they actually, the, the number of particles we actually create tends to depend on the distance between them. And so it's, again, it seems in, seemed inconceivable to me that we can think about the distance between two nuclei, but we, we can see here that when two nuclei collide, one from the left and one from the right, you, this is a cartoon and it's a very, 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 um, very crude cartoon. But you can see that when they when they're colliding, there's an overlap region, which one's coming from the left, one's coming from the right. And the dark nucleons are the ones that actually interact with each other. And each of those is kind of like a little proton-proton collision. And it turns out that if you count the number of those that interact that you, and you multiply the number of particles in a typical proton-proton collision, that's how you can actually get to these thousands of particles that we see in a heavy ion collision, because we're basically multiplying a proton-proton collision by this overlap geometry of the two. Conversely, that there are also these lighter colored nucleons. This is just from the cartoon. And in those, that these don't interact. And, and what they do is they shear off from the nucleus and they keep going forward at these very, very high beam energies. And what's happening is that the, we could, we call these guys spectators. They're just watching what goes on. And as they're going forward, there's a really interesting thing that goes on that sometimes some of the protons and neutrons find each other and make little nuclei, and then they spin off and go somewhere else. But the neutrons, which are completely neutral, they aren't steered by any of the, any of the magnets in the LHC, and they keep going straight. And we call these forward neutrons, and we can actually see these and measure these. And, and you actually can then be sensitive to the geometry by the fact that when you have few spectators, you have a big overlap and all those nucleons interact with each other. And when you have a lot of spectators, it means that actually they were far apart from each other and you'll get a few particles. So, so you get a big, big variation in multiplicity. And then if you, then you could, but then we can actually take this even further. And sometimes we even have collisions where the two nuclei, which are these you know, blobs of protons and neutrons, where they completely miss each other. And strangely enough, we can actually see a lot of action going on when they do that, because on the next slide, um, you can, what happens at fully ionized nuclei, these are now these now the charge of 82 protons. They have very, very strong electromagnetic fields, especially when you when you boost them to very, very high energies. The electromagnetic fields, which should be spherical around them, they get boosted to these little pancakes of electromagnetic fields, and they become sources of very, very high energy photons, which are particles of light. And it turns out that the light in these fields, little particles of light can collide with each other and with the other nucleus. So we actually have this tool where you can actually use light to collide with itself and also collide with the nucleus. And this is really neat because essentially you, you can take photons and you collide them with each other. And it's a very, it's a very well-known process. You can actually create matter. So you can actually create electrons and positrons simply just from the, the, the scattering of light by light. You can actually, and, and, and then even you can make jokes about lightsabers and things, <laughs> things colliding with each other. Um, it's a really neat process that I'll show you a couple of examples of later. Um, and then, we, we can also, and then, and then we have, but we have, what we need to do in order to, to, to do this more carefully, we need to actually have detectors which can see these spectator neutrons. And what we've done is we've taken, that we go down the tunnel and there's a place where the single beam pipe or the two, or the two beams are, are colliding with each other where they split apart. And in that region where they split, we can actually put detectors and we call them zero degree calorimeters because they literally sit zero degrees from the beam line. And so there's a magnet that steers the beams apart from each other and we put it and we put a de detector there right where they come apart. It also turns out they're, they're protecting part of the machine system, but that's a whole other story. But we'll, we can, on the next slide, you can actually see that there's this region of the LHC called the TAN. It's the target absorber for neutrals. It's a place where the one beam pipe goes in and then in this pipe that they call a pair of pants for obvious reasons, um, the, the, the two pipes split apart. And then that, then that's basically that goes to the rest of the machine where there are two independent beams of protons going in opposite directions. Um, and like I said, the, it sits in this region and there's, a, there's usually when we, when we are not there during a heavy ion collision, there's a lot of copper there, which, which serves the same purpose of protecting a very important LHC dipole, which is a little bit downstream of us. I should also mention that as during collisions, during proton-proton collisions, especially, lots and lots of radiation piles up there after the after after these runs. And so, actually, when we're installing there in these regions at the end of every year, we have to wait often a few days sometimes uh, before approaching it for the radiation to dissipate. 
And it turns out that there was already a slot, which was already there when, when the machine was designed, and, and there was enough space to put a really cool hadron calorimeter. Now, what's a hadron calorimeter? That's on the next slide. Hadron calor the, the concept of a hadron calorimeter is you put a bunch of material in the way of, of, of a particle coming in. The particle hits the material. It makes a big shower of other particles, and then some of the particles make other showers, et cetera. You make this very, very complicated thing called hadronic shower, which I show a cartoon, almost in German, shown here. Oops, go back one, please. Um, and you put, and, and then in this, you have this heavy material, then you put little slices of sensitive material, and you can see some fraction of that energy in something you read out. You typically convert it into light, and then you have, you have photo detectors at the top of the detector, which basically read it out and turn it into something we can see with our, with, with our detector. And I think you go back to more. Oh, oh and, then, and then what happens in, in a typical heavy ion collision, this is shown here, like Martin showed before, with thousands of particles. Typically, we see signals in both directions, in, in both, the, to both to the left and to the right. And so this is a very characteristic signal, which we use in order to, to say that we know that we had a real collision because we saw, four, we saw neutrons coming in both directions. It also turns out that the number of neutrons is correlated in both directions. Sometimes we also want to want to ask where where did those um, where, where did those clouds of neutrons go? It turns out when when they overlap only partially, it turns out because of, of the interaction between the nuclei, the clouds of neutrons that go toward the, the zero degree calorimeters get a little bit deflected. Sometimes they, they, one goes in one direction, say up, and then in the and then the other beam the other in the other direction it goes a little bit down. We've actually also put in not just not just um, detectors to to measure the energy, but we've also put in detectors to measure the position by putting in this kind of interesting kind of pan flute design of fibers, which can then which can then be sensitive to the different directions that the new that the neutrons can go. What's amazing is that we want to measure shifts of only a couple of millimeters after traveling 140 meters, so a tiny fraction of a degree. And so these two reaction plane detectors that we've installed, which I'll show you a picture of a little picture of later, we, are, are basically designed to do just this. And so here, so here's a here's a a, a, um, a movie of there we put a GoPro on the reaction plane detector, and now we're going into the through the retinal scan and then into the elevator. This elevator is going down, down, down about 100 meters. It pops out, go through the green doors and down the hall, and then go. You go through another retinal scan, make sure that nobody gets in there without being identified. And then we go through this region here. We pass the guys controlling the crane. We go through around some absorber, and now we're in the LHC tunnel. And this is fun because we're going about 60 or 70 meters further, and then we reach the, the, the absorber. And then at that point, there are some guys who we passed before who are operating a crane remotely. They're actually, they're literally hundreds of meters from this crane and they use this and there are a couple of people watching and we lift each module of the ZDC and we put it in and we basically insert these four modules of the ZDC into the TAN and then also the, the reaction plane detector which sits in, in between all of those. And so you see, you see people looking at it very carefully, but none of the people there are actually controlling the crane. The crane is actually being controlled by, by these, this series of cameras um, and sorry, a joystick and then people monitoring by cameras. And it's a very, very precise operation that we are not allowed to do. We have professionals do this kind of work all the time. And then at that point, I think the movie ends around now that the crane retracts. And if you go to the next next slide, then what? Then, then the physicists take over. And then you have three of my colleagues here who were here a couple of weeks ago putting it there. The tan is shown by this by this this wrapped thing in the middle that, that that's a uh, that's a, a shield to basically keep you keep you um, from burning yourself. Um, and, the, and then they, then the detectors come out and are inserted. And then on the next slide, you see people actually installing the detector. And, th and then you actually attach the signal cables and the high voltage cables and some optical fibers. And so, and this is actually where, where one of our students is actually, our, our student Matthew is actually, in, actually attaching this detector very, very precisely to, to the TAN to avoid, avoid it moving. This is the position sensitive detector and we have to keep it, we have to know that position very, very accurately, because again, we're trying to measure very, very small distances. So I think that's it for my little section. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, so, so now, I mean, Peter, Peter have basically discussed how the ZDC was, uh, was, was preparing for the heavy ion run. And now uh, I would like to share with you what we are actually expecting to do this year or actually uh, probably next week. So uh, the last, last time we took these heavy ion collisions, this was in 2018. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been some time, five, five years ago. And we are really we are really looking forward to to collect more more data. Why why actually we need more data? Because it's actually all about there. Are, it's all about two things: about the number of collisions and the energy of these collisions. It's uh, usually people think that the energy this is what is what is really important, 
and they don't think that we actually need a lot of these collisions. And uh, the reason for that is actually nature uh, plays uh, roulette with us. And most of these collisions are actually pretty boring uh, because, I mean, you collide two protons or two ions and you create something that you already know or something that is not <clears throat> so exciting. And if you need to study uh, something new, if you want to discover something new, or you want to understand the details, you have to have a lot of data to be able to do uh, precision precision measurements. So that's why we need uh, billions of these collisions, and we cannot look you know, only at, at a single collision. And also, I mean, if we have higher energy, typically then we can measure more excited or more rare uh, processes. And also actually with higher energy, we have higher probability of creating even things that we have already, already, already measured. And this year, we expect to uh, collect actually twice more data than we were able to do over the whole run two, which means uh, from 2015 to uh, 2018. And we will have also, also a slightly higher uh, collision energy. It's actually interesting, uh, like uh, when physicists talk about uh, the energy uh, at the LAC, we use uh, units of, of tera electron volts, which is like kind of like a, maybe a weird unit. Uh, so just uh, to give some perspective, I mean, when you collide two protons at the LHC, LHC the collision energy is uh, slightly above uh, 6 TV. What does it mean? If you collide two protons with a, with a 6 TV and you, you use this uh, famous uh, formula E is uh, mc squared, it means that from two colliding protons, you can create up to 4,000 new protons. You create a matter from energy. But you know, creating protons is 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 boring because you, you know them. So we we want to create something something different. Also, if you collide two protons, it's like collecting uh, colliding actually uh, two uh, two mosquitoes, which is you know not a lot of energy. But then the energy uh, of the uh, of the ions beams is actually lower of of, of the ions, and that's uh, because. Uh, the, the lead ions, uh, they are composed not only uh, with protons that are charged, that you can actually accelerate and bend, but there are also, also neutrons, uh, which are neutral. And then basically the magnets, they will not act on the, on the neutrons and uh, they, they are kind of like a dead, dead weight. So that's why the energy of the, of the ion beam is, is, is lower. So now let me introduce the, the heavy ion group. So me and Peter, we are part of the heavy ion group. Uh, it's, uh, the heavy ion group is relatively small within the ATLAS. I mean, ATLAS is like a more than three and a half thousand physicists. Uh, the heavy ion group is small. It's like a 50, 50 people from 14 institutions and from eight different, uh, different countries. And uh, I think three, three continents. You can see a couple of pictures from a few conferences, uh, workshops, and, and uh, two from very nice, uh, nice dinners. And how actually we operate the ATLAS. So you cannot imagine it that, you know, 50 people come to CERN and we say, okay, now, now the ATLAS is, is us for, uh, for five weeks and, you know, you can do uh, other stuff. Uh, we actually we even couldn't do it. The ATLAS is so complicated that you cannot even operate it, you know, with 50 people only. You really need all these experts, all the support. Uh, you know, you need a lot of lot, lot of help from all these people that normally do the, the, the PP physics or, you know, they take, take care of the running the detector conditions and, 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 and so and so on. Uh, so there are still like a many experts from the, this proton proton side, as we, as we call it, involved in the, uh, in the, in the, in the data taking. Uh, the, what's really uh, sometimes even stressful part is the preparation and planning for the run because there are a lot of degrees of freedoms and in principle a lot of discussions you can imagine that you know within the atlas you have more than 3000 people there is just a lot of discussion within the atlas like what collisions what should be the setting and so on now at the beginning i said that at the LHC you have three other big experiments they are also interested in taking these heavy ion data so every experiment has some wishes. Every experiment has some limitations. Uh, there is uh, there are some problems with the machine, with the LHC. There is some development. Uh, uh, the availability of the, of the people plays uh, plays role. There are various technical stops. So just planning, you know, where we should take these data, what data, what will be the exact conditions, the number of collisions, and so on. It's actually a lot of lot of discussions, and also like a lot of changes. 
uh, you know, just uh, we originally were supposed to take this heavy underground last year, but then due to the you know uh, significant changes in the in the cost of the of the energy, there was a lot of discussion what to do, and we we moved the heavy underground taking uh, to to this year, you know, to accommodate uh, uh, this uh, uh, the, the, these uh, these constraints. So it's uh, uh, I mean the, the close picture as you can imagine, you know, organization and preparation of the run is like a it's like a V Atlas and the, the whole group uh, riding a, a, a roller coaster up and uh, up and down. Uh, so during the heavy hand run, so which uh, we hope will start, we will start the data taking uh, in the middle of the of the next year. We actually expect that uh, up to thirty people from these fifty will actually come to CERN. And we'll be looking at the data as, as they are coming, because checking the data quality is, is really essential. I mean, you you can, if you don't do it, uh, you know, you will be taking data for a few weeks, and then you know you might find out that there are there, there are some serious problems, and then you can't simply fix it. So we have like a lot of people. Uh, they they look at the data in a, in a, in in a real time. There are a lot of you know like a plots. We we compare. The data that are coming from the detector with like old data with, with simulations and and so on and actually for that it's really important that we have this like a, even we are a small group but it's really important that the, the people are are here you can see a couple of a couple of uh, pictures from from last year so the left this is a uh, our typical room where we sit and 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 discuss uh it's near the atlas detector this is from 2011. On the right side, this is actually a really interesting place. It's a it's a it's a bus. Uh, it's a London double decker. Uh, this is from 20, 2016. So sometimes uh, we have meetings at, uh, at uh, some uh, funny uh, uh, funny places. You can see me and Peter sitting in the in the back. Uh, during the data taking, we typically you know people people work through the day. Then we have like a daily meetings to to discuss and and, and share what's going on in the news and also you know to present to each other if there are any problems or or, or, or things like uh, things like that. So we we, we meet and, and 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 talk a lot. And of course, we spend a lot of time in the Atlas control room. So here you can see two pictures uh, from the Atlas control room. It's like a, it's actually incredible place you know a lot of monitors a lot of lcd panels a lot of information again most of the people you can actually see at these uh these pictures they are not from the heavy ion group this is really the support that we that we get from the atlas uh from the atlas collaborations so you can see shifters experts but still we are there and we are we are we are checking the data and, and settings and, and and everything and uh what i would like to discuss a bit is actually how we select these events these these collisions because i said that a lot of them are are boring and we actually cannot store every data because we see about like a 50,000 collisions per per second the size of the collision is like a couple of megabytes so this would be like a huge a huge uh, rate of, of of data which we cannot store and some of them are actually not not of a good use for us uh, so and actually in heavy ion collisions the rate is much smaller than in pp collisions so what we do is that we choose only up to like uh, 1500 events uh, per, per second and we store those. But then the question is, what is the interesting event? And that's really, it depends on the personal taste because, you know, you have a physicist that is interested in, in electrons. You have a physicist that is interested in two muons and, 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 and so on. So there is also like a lot of discussion within the heavy ion group, you know, how to balance and uh, what what data we should uh, we should uh, we should store. Uh, so I mentioned that I mean now we are going to take the, the heavy ion collisions, but we also uh, actually uh, always try to record some proton proton collisions at the same energy. Uh, the heavy ion physicists they are know that they love uh, ratios, so we typically measure something in the lead collisions and then. We compare it to our reference, which is the proton-proton, uh, which is the same process, but in proton-proton collisions. It, it tells us, you know, if there are some differences between the physics uh, in, in heavy ions and in, uh, in, in PP. And for that, we need to record also some PP collisions, but at, at lower energy that is normally done uh, for the, uh, the physics that... Uh, you know, uh, people on Atlas uh, do, you know, when you study Higgs uh, boson and you look for like a supersymmetry and, 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 and these things. 
And so we also do neat things with the zero degree calorimeters. I mentioned that these things, these things see that the, the neutrons will go forward. I should also mention that when those, when the, the, the nuclei fly past each other, they also, the photons knock neutrons out of each other. So actually at the same time, we're getting 50,000 um, interactions of heavy ions per second. We're getting millions of neutrons from photon interactions per second. It's a completely different, different universe of interactions. And we actually can combine the interaction from with the, the information of the ZDC with other things like jets and photons and the muon, this cousin of the electron, to make a, another trigger, which decides if we keep this event. And so we actually, we sometimes we actually look at that sometimes events instead of having two two ZDCs firing, one in the one in the in one direction, one in the other. Sometimes we actually look at at at, at different kinds of ZDC topologies, where sometimes there's no ZDCs firing, which really which indicates that it's just two photons that hit each other. And sometimes we have one ZDC firing, which actually indicates that we have one ZDC hitting, um, that one photon hits another nucleus. And then, and then of course, we also have a lot, a lot of triggers in which we, we look at the two of them firing, and which is a good starting point. And in run three, we've even developed a whole new system where we can actually detect in the ZDC in real time, whether we have a few neutrons, which is characteristic of an electromagnetic interaction, or many, many neutrons, and all this in real time. This is all going through signals in the detector that runs effectively like little computer programs at 40 megahertz and tells us what kind of event. And I'll give a couple of examples of events like this next, um, which are kind of neat. Oops, oh, oh, I actually changed the talk, so maybe maybe go back, Martin. I thought I, I changed the I changed our main one, but I guess you have a copy. So maybe just keep going then. Sorry. Okay. We'll go uh, back. Later that, back you will have a few pictures like at the end, yeah, so we can we can That's we fine. can go back to them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so I will just briefly touch actually what we what we measure, uh, but in these like a non ultra peripheral collisions. So when we have the overlap between the the two ions, so when we collide, you know these these two ions, we create this like a droplets of, of quark gluon plasma. So it's like a, this hot and dense dense matter that expands. And we typically measure like the observables that are uh, connected with like uh, some global properties of this, of, this, uh, of this fireball. And for that, we measure the particle production. So for example, we try to identify all the particles that are produced. And then we look, you know, at, at the directions of these particles and we somehow try to correlate. And this can tell us something about the properties of the, of the quark gluon plasma. We can actually also uh, try to probe or penetrate the quark gluon plasma with, for example, photons or jets, which are like footprints of like a high energy quarks. And when these photons or the quarks, when they are passing at the quark gluon plasma, they interact. In principle, they can interact with it or not interact with it in terms of the photons. And they can tell us something, again, about the, the, the properties of this quark gluon plasma or actually about the, the force, like uh, the strong force, because these quarks, they interact through the through a strong a strong interaction. You can imagine it as, uh, you know, if you are uh, going to have a CT in your hospital, and if you are in the CT, there is like a source of the photons of gamma rays that goes through your body, then uh, it interacts in your body. And then on the other side of the body, there is the, the detector. And you detect and you see, you know, what is inside you. Here, we cannot penetrate the... Uh, the quark gluon plasma from the outside because the li lifetime of it is very short, but we can penetrate it from the from the inside, as you can see on this uh, on this picture. So this is uh, this is how th these are you know, just a uh, uh, few ideas. You know what what uh, what we look when we uh, what we look at when when we analyze the, these collisions, and this brings me actually how we analyze these data because I. I, I mentioned that the, the, the event size is like a, one collision is like a few megabytes and we store like a record like 1.5 kilohertz or so 1500 events per second. And that actually gives you still a lot of data. You get hundreds of terabytes of the data, which means that you actually cannot use your normal computers. And if you, you know, store them on, on, on CDs, it would be like a 150 kilometers, you know, uh, tall, uh, tall column just over the, over the year. What we do is that we use a computing farm, almost like a supercomputers. Some of one of them is in CERN. This is on the, on the left side, but then we also have something that is called LHC computing grid. So these are like a data centers, you know, uh, around the, the, the world in different countries. And you know, I can just sit here in CERN. I will I will write my my computer program. You know, send it out. It will you know the, the code will will be sent to, for example, US in in Brookhaven where people. Uh, the, the, the home laboratory of Peter, 
and uh, there is like a computer that will you know process uh, my my algorithm over the data that sits there and then send me back some 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 for example nice nice pictures and when you go over these over these data a lot of data sometimes you find something interesting like like we did in uh, 2010 that we for the first time observed the the jet quenching which is like the suppression of these quarks that go through this uh, quark gluon plasma uh, by picture if you want to see how how such a discovery looks like it's it's on the on the right plot so the 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 difference the fact that there is a difference between the black and the other two distribution means that there is something going on something interesting in this uh, in this quark gluon plasma but then I was, we, were, we were talking about jets. We also have cool things where I was mentioning before that when, when you have photons hitting, hitting a nucleus, we have these neat things where a photon from one nucleus actually hits the other nucleus. And so in one direction, it's just, it just emitted a photon and the, and the nucleus kept together and nothing happens over here. So this huge detector that can see thousands of particles and really there's nothing over here and just two jets in the other direction. But what's nice is that the other direction sees a ZDC firing. And so actually, although Martin is right that we have these huge computers that analyze the data offline, even online, Atlas is a huge computer system by itself called this trigger system, which can actually find these events very quickly. So we can really identify these events and take all of these to tape to make sure that we get them all at once. And so it's a very powerful system, but it's really crucial to have the right detectors that can do this for you. Another neat thing we have is on the next one, is, is is even is even less activity in the detector where basically the, the the two nuclei pass by each other and two particles of light interact with each other and then scattered off to the side and so again you have this incredibly sophisticated detector and all we want to see is just two two particles coming out and so this is a very very special thing this was really a needle in a haystack we have literally like tens of events over the billions of events that we took during this run and so we really need atlas to do this and then this then then, then all of our analysis to find these and so again, it's a really real testament to the sort of this amazing system where Atlas is, which is again lots of amazing detectors and lots of, and thousands of people to find these two particles once in a while. And it was a real special thing and really special discovery. So I think we're about to wrap up. Yeah, uh, we, we reached the end of uh, of uh, this uh, this uh, this talk or presentation. Uh, so we we try to you know give you a bit of taste like uh, that we uh, what we do uh, with Atlas uh, with these heavy ion collisions. Uh, we you know um, try to discuss not only the, the the physics that is that is very interesting and actually I would recommend you there was a, a previous recording by our colleague and and Sickles and she was discussing a bit more you know all these measurements or all these fantastic physics that that we do. But in the in the past forty minutes, we try to more focus on the on this like we call it operation aspects. You know, like uh, uh, how how we prepare for the run and install things and and and, and you know coordinate uh, everything, which uh, is usually a very busy area, uh, very busy time uh, as, as 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 now. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. Things are changing actually from from hour uh, to hour. But also, actually, it's a it's a it's a lot of fun for uh, for for all of us. So so thank you for uh, for listening, and yeah, we will be happy, you know, to to take questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter and Martin, for this super nice talk. It has been very interesting, and we already have some questions. Um, yeah, let's go directly to the Q and A session. So let's start from YouTube. So why has it been so long since the last data collection? Peter, do you want to start? Sure. Um, it, the last time we took data was in 2018 and quite a few things have happened since 2018. Um, the most important thing was that during that, as soon as the run was ended, we, we are the last thing to happen in a, in, a, in a particular calendar year. And right after the last heavy iron, data taking stopped in 2018, they went right to what they call the long shutdown two, in which there were many, many changes made to the machine and many, 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 you know, many people started moving into the tunnel, into the detectors, both the machine and the especially the detectors had to be had go through major upgrades during the shutdown period. I should say, speaking from the ZDC side, we immediately went to work trying to basically planning our major upgrade, we essentially changed out many, many aspects of the system. We designed new electronics. We put in very, very expensive, fancy new cables that went, that ran all the way from, from our electronics um, in the cavern, all the way down into the tunnel. 
Um, many things happened. And then of course, COVID happened and COVID, COVID caused even more delays because all of a sudden many people were home and many projects which, which were going suffered many delays. So where we were, where we thought we were supposed to come back in 2021, that was moved to 2022. And then last year, as Martin mentioned, we had a confluence of, of, of a couple of, of bad things. There was actually, there was, a, there was a disruption which actually led to the machine going down for a few weeks that delayed us from one side. And then, then because of the energy crisis in Europe, the run got cut off from the other direction. So our run, our heavy iron run got squeezed from both sides. And it was decided for practical reasons that as soon as it became so short that we couldn't really get enough done, we moved it to this year. And now we are anxiously awaiting the start of beam time this year to get to get going again. So I hope that explains it. There was a lot of different factors coming in. And even though it sounds like a long time, it's amazing. It goes a lot, goes really fast. We, we stay busy 100% of the time. We do more of our physics during the shutdown than we do during the runs because we're busy doing runs. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the answer, Peter. We have another one super interesting. Can you only trigger with CDC or it must be combined with another part of the detector? So it, uh, okay, I can, I can start sure. this. I can try to answer <laughs> this one. Uh, so, uh, so you can, we have some triggers uh, that use uh, almost, you can use only ZDC, but typically we, we combine them. Uh, so uh, also what uh, maybe, I don't know if Peter mentioned it, but Atlas is using like a multi-level system or like a two-level system. So first first level is like a very fast because the, the collisions are you know coming like a, with, a, with a high rate. And if you have like a software, like a algorithms, they are not fast enough to be able to deal with, with the trade. So we have uh, like a level one system that is more like a hardware base that is like a very fast. And the CDC uh, sends signal to this like a level one. And then we typically run a software trigger in the, in the second step that has a bit more time to make the decision. And then, you know, we, we, uh, we run various different algorithms that looks for uh, muons, electrons. You can do like a track counting, uh, measured jets, and so on. But then, if we have these like hadronic interactions, uh, what we actually do sometimes is that we put uh, like a veto on the ZDC that we don't want to have a ZDC signal at all. And then uh, we use like a signal from like other parts of the, of the detector, from like a calorimeters, uh, muon, muon detectors, and so on. And as, and as time goes by, this trigger system will get more and more sophisticated such that the level one part that now is rel relatively simple thresholds and on detectors will almost be like full analysis of data in real time. It'll be a, it'll be a little it's hardware based, but the, the analysis will get more and more sophisticated and more and more fast to handle the high luminosities coming up. And the, and the ZDC will take advantage, oh, sorry, the heavy iron program will take advantage of that too. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, we have another one a bit more personal. What are you most excited to see in the upcoming experiment or maybe in the upcoming data taking period? Yeah. I can, I can both uh, answer or what's, what's the most uh, interesting uh, topic for you? For me? Oh, I would say the most interesting thing is we're just going to get a lot more data on photon-photon collisions, and we're going to get a lot more interesting processes like that. And people, and as we keep talking about it, people have more and more ideas of things that we can do with the data, and our triggers are getting more and more flexible that we'll be able to take lots of different, we'll have, we'll have many more channels than we had before in previous years. Um, and so in terms of the complexity of our trigger menu, much, much more of it seems to go toward photon-photon <laughs> stuff because we have many more specific things to look for. But what are you most interested in, Martin? So I kind of split it uh, now. Uh, so the one part of me is really interested actually in these uh, photon-photon collisions. I mean, it's just fascinating that we can use the LHC as the, you know, to collide uh, like uh, particles of light. On the other hand, I mean, when we have more data, we can measure some like a very rare processes with like a very high energy. So, uh, I mean, since my PhD, I was, I've been interested in like a jet physics, these footprints of, uh, of quarks. So I would like to, you know, do some like a de detail measurement of, of these objects, you know, look inside, understand the structure, how the structure is affected when it's going through the through the plasma. So these, these kind of things, but really besides cool. that, I'm kind of, yeah, split it. And we're just getting so much more data that we'll be able to look yeah. at that much more detail than before. Wow, nice, interesting. So let's move now to Instagram. Um, Will you be colliding oxygen this year? 
As it turns out, we'll be colliding oxygen, we hope, next year. That is a super exciting thing to look for for a couple of reasons. One is because oxygen is a nucleus, but it's a relatively small nucleus. So we're excited. We, uh, one of the big trends of our field is looking for quark gluon plasma in smaller and smaller and smaller volumes. Because we've seen things that look like quark gluon plasma in big systems like lead lead collisions. And we even think we see quark gluon plasma in proton proton collisions or even in photon pro photon nucleus collisions, all kinds of things like that. Oxygen is a way to actually test some of, our, the, of what we understand in much more detail. And proton oxygen is exciting to a lot of people and people who are even outside of heavy ion physics because cosmic rays come through the atmosphere, which is made of oxygen. And so people are really excited to try to get more and more detailed data on what can be helped to tune air shower models. So people, there's a whole field of physics out there who's very, very excited to see oxygen in the LHC. Now, of course, we don't know when it's gonna be. So we are on tenterhooks waiting for the scheduling, waiting to hear what's gonna happen next year. It could be as early as the first thing we do next year. It could be in the middle of the year, it could be late in the year, but whatever happens, we're gonna be there and we're gonna make sure that we're there to see it. Wow, it's also, that's super interesting, <laughs> oxygen. <laughs> oxygen. Okay. Wow, good. So let's go now to a bit more from YouTube. So why does the CDC have to be rem to be moved remotely, as you that, show in the video? Yeah. That is a really interesting question. It's, I mean, it has to be, so it has to be, it's heavy enough that it has to be handled by a crane. It's sort of 50 to 80 kilograms per module. And you need to be able to do it precisely, so you can't have a human being doing it. Doing it it's just simply too heavy. There's also there. In, in another aspect of it is it is also done for for radiation safety. That that when we are really putting the detector into the into the absorber, there is residual radiation inside this thing, which in principle could be additional exposure we want to avoid. And so the remote handling system is really designed to be keep people in principle as far away from it as we can. And so we are. The, the lab is very, CERN is very, is very worried about, about radiation safety, that we as people are, and our families are worried about radiation safety. And so it's done very, very safely. As it, as it turns out, the, the exposure we get is relatively modest, um, but it is something we keep, keep, keep track of. So this is something which is important for, and for working by a system which is, which is absorbing radiation all the time and absorbing particles. As we get to the high luminosity detector and the machine in, in upcoming years, in, in about at the, at the end of this decade, there, the radiation from the proton-proton runs will be so high that we have we, that we're designing the system in order to be as minimally exposed to to that as we, as possible. It'll be a faster installation and simpler installation, and we may also have to wait longer and longer times before it's safe to operate. So it's really it's really a key part of the system, and designing the cranes and designing the access to the cranes is a crucial part of this detector system. Hey, thank you. Yeah. So now let's keep it on YouTube. What other ions can the LHC collide? I'll let you do that, Martin. So, yeah. Uh, so, so far, I mean, so we, we have uh, we have had collisions of uh, of lead ions. We actually also had a collisions of the lead ion and the proton. Uh, we had those in, I think, 2016. And then uh, in 2017, we actually collided uh, two uh, xenons. Uh, so it was like a very short data taking. It was like uh, only like a one day, but we also got like a really interesting, uh, interesting data. I mean, the motivation is very similar as uh, was discussed by 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 Peter. Is the, the xenon is like a bit bit larger nuclei. So now that's why we are really like you know excited about the possibility of of collisions of oxygen. And again, we should not con only uh, collide an oxygen with the oxygen, but also a proton with the with the oxygen. So that's kind of the, the, I think that I covered like everything. And the machine can handle almost anything. Um, the people have been asking for argon and krypton. There, there are many, many, many nuclei which are in principle available in large numbers and which can be be processed, be put through the machine. It's to some level a question of the schedule for the program. So the, the different different experiments want different things. Um, some of the experiments really, really want more lead lead data all the time. Whereas we've been pretty consistent. We really, we, we would love to see some of the smaller systems. We learn a lot. We test our intuitions about the geometry and about how things work by going to smaller systems. And that there's a lot of history of that. So we're hoping we can do that in run four, but sometimes people talk about run five, which is years from now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let's go now to another question on YouTube. Has there 
been any suggestions of extra dimensions <laughs> or any uh, no uh the short answer is no <laughs> uh so that's actually like a part of the physics that we typically like a don't try to search for in the heavy ion collisions uh this is more in uh, an area of the of these like a uh, high luminosity high intensity proton proton collisions we are uh, moving a bit uh a bit to this direction as well to you know search like for like a new particles not directly like an extra extra dimensions but to search search for like a particles of like a dark matter because i mean we know that our universe is made out of only like a five percent of this like a matter that no that, that i had on the first slide you know these like a protons electrons uh neutrons it's only like a five percent of the universe and there is like a 26 percent of uh, something that we call dark matter it should be like a particles but we know nothing about it and that's like a you know really big portion of the of the program of uh, the LHC to, to to try to understand or search for this uh, for these particles and in the past in heavy ions uh, this was uh, People didn't think, you know, that we could use like heavy, heavy ions to, to do such, such searches. But actually, these photon-photon uh, collisions, they are sensitive to, to such a processes. So we have we have a physics program where people try to search, for example, for axions, which in principle could be candidates for this like a dark matter particle, but no extra dimensions. And I mean, so far we haven't seen, you know, any any footprints of such a such a new new particles. But I would be remiss not to interrupt a little bit and say that people use techniques based on extra dimensions to do calculations for normal heavy ion collisions. There's a whole range of calculations people have been doing for about 20 years now, which actually model heavy ion collisions as being a four dimensional thing embedded in five dimensions. And actually the, the sort of the temperature of the quark gluon plasma is actually something which exists in this fifth dimension. And so the physics and mathematics of the higher dimensions actually is something which people explore with heavy ions. And people were very excited about heavy ions to explore this part of it. It's not something you'd explore directly with particle physics, but it's a complicated thing. And there are, so many, there are many aspects where, where what we do is not quite like what the calculations want, but it's an intellectually very exciting sort of convergence of the two fields. So no extra dimensions, but maybe the math. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Now... Mm -mm. Um, okay, from YouTube, is there any suggestion to have an accelerator that only collides ions? No. <laughs> no. Uh, no. Uh, I mean, so right now, I, I, I mean, this it's actually Peter is involved in, in experiments in, in, in US in, in Brookhaven. So I think you should you should go ahead and maybe well, discuss I, uh, Rick a bit. But what's very clear is that the machines that can accelerate ions also can accelerate smaller systems. And so what, what, what characterizes these machines is the flexibility to do proton-proton, proton-ion, ion-ion, many different things. And so it's the flexibility of the machine that's that's really notable. There, I, 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 but we, I should be careful. There are, of course, machines out there which, which primarily accelerate nuclei. There's, there's a major nuclear physics facilities in the United States. There are facilities all over the world which actually focus on the nuclear side of it. And these are nuclear physics accelerators. Um, but these high energy colliders typically focus on both. So even the future circular collider at CERN, this huge new project that people are discussing for decades from now, um, there will be a, there there will be a heavy ion component of that. Um, I should mention one, you know, thing about we we keep talking about the radiation, but the the ion program is one of the key things that lets the accelerator cool down and become less radioactive before they need to open it up at the end of every year. So the ions play a very practical role as well in the program that you can do very productive physics like we were discussing today and still be useful for the, for the overall operation of the machine. But um, I don't imagine we'll get a heavy ion collider which we specifically for heavy ions in the future. But, nor, but, but again, our, our field, the thing that characterizes our field is, is our wide range of interest in a, in a variety of sizes. Also, I mean, as, as I said, uh, uh, typically we need actually to compare the measurements in, in in ions to some reference and the reference is usually some simple or more simple system like the the, the proton proton so that's also the reason why you typically also want to have a collisions of like a for example protons in the same machine absolutely yeah makes sense thank you yes there is now a question regarding radiation what causes the radiation from the collisions um, everything. So every, every, many, many processes occur, which which cause radiation to be emitted at, at a variety, a variety of types and a variety of levels. 
fortunately for us, many of these sources of, of residual radiation have very, very short half-lives. They basically die out very, very quickly. They're in the tunnel itself. There are a few places that get a little hotter than other places, but typically, um, so again, a lot of it is from, is again, comes from the collisions themselves and the collision products spraying all over the place. And there are lots and lots of soft neutrons floating everywhere. But then of course the particles hit the material in, in, in the tunnel, along the side, and the beam pipe, and the absorber, and these also cause various um, various kind of various processes, especially ex, you know excitations of different nuclei which are there, which then as they decay cause radioactivity that, that you can see. So that there are many many different processes, and so there are people whose job it is within the machine to actually run computer programs that actually simulate these many 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 different processes, and they can map out in incredible detail the amount of activity that they expect to see in many different parts. Um, we actually, and we have members of our team who've worked very closely with the, with the machine people, especially when we're designing future future um, detectors and future upgrades to make sure that we understand what the exposure that we will have and what the detectors will have, et cetera. It's a very, very important part of of, of the the way we think about you know putting a detector into a beam like this. Okay, yeah, thank you. And um, coming back to the trigger a bit. Is there any worry that you have tossed out possibly interesting data? Uh, there is always a worry, you know, that's why we have to be very careful and uh, test everything, you know, even like before uh, we start to take the data. So uh, there are quite strict uh, procedures uh, within the Atlas, uh, you know, you cannot, you know, just uh, you know, have some code uh, and just, you know, upload it to the Atlas and this, then just let it run. It, uh, it, it wouldn't work. Uh, so everything has to be tested, uh, tested and validated. But of course, there is an always a chance, you know, that something will go wrong and then you will have to fix it. And actually, like in the past, during almost every heavy hand run, it's uh, the software that you use at the beginning of the data taking is a bit different than what is, you know, at the, at the end. Because we find some small problems that we need to fix you know, sometimes people realize that you know we, we forgot about something, so we want to add. Uh, we need to react, you know, on the data as they are they are coming. But we also take lots of data that's called minimum bias, where we we take a very very loose trigger, only a, you know maybe one particle or more, and that and this can basically take lots and lots of data for lots of different kinds of collisions that essentially aren't controlled or biased or or sort of shaped by your trigger itself. The catch being. In order to see something rare, you need to take lots and lots of data. The upside being that that you you know that at some level there was something really easy that was really amazing that your trigger wouldn't have seen. You'll see it in that data set. So we cover our bases from many different angles when we take data because we're always worried about that. It's an, it's a natural thing to worry about. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. So we are arriving to the one hour mark. So let's take two last questions. Uh, one of them is how you can detect particles or ions, knowing that the time between collisions is very short. Do you do, I'm not sure if I uh, fully understand how to... Uh, the, the time between collisions is very short, is short. But, but the detector system is designed that the, the way that the signals come into the detector rise and fall in such a way that we have we know that we are able to to basically resolve two different collisions even if they happen very quickly i mentioned these very expensive cables we put in for the zvc we put them in specifically because in two consecutive collisions we were having signals in just the zvc itself that were overlapping and were making it very hard to analyze the data they, it, it actually made it very hard to, one of our data sets for proton proton ion was so intense that we had a lot of trouble analyzing the very high rate data. And so we had to really, we had to redo our system, even though we had to pay a lot of money for it to, in order to make sure that we could always resolve two consecutive collisions. Atlas as a whole is designed very, very carefully with that in mind. Atlas in general, one particular element of Atlas rarely sees two collisions right after each other because the, the, the particles are, there aren't, aren't that many particles and there are many, many, many detector elements. But 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 it, that but the the notion of pileup and, and and events happening both at the same time too quickly and right after each other too quickly is very much part of how the system is designed, and so it is something we have to be careful of. But it's it's something we can handle. I mean, also actually in, in these heavy arms collisions, uh, so just uh, you know, if you have the beams and you would imagine that you we stop them and we look at the structure of the beam, 
in normal PP operations, it will look like uh, that there is like this like a bunch of, of protons, you know, like a pile of protons, like 10 to 11 of protons. And then there is like a gap of like a seven meters and then another bunch of protons, seven meters. Uh, in ions, if you look at the, the beam in the same way, you would first see that the number of ions is, is, is smaller and also the gaps are bigger. So, so this year, actually, for the first time, the gap will be only like a 14 meters. But for example, in 2018, the gap between these right. two bunches of ions was like a 21 meters. Right. And, and this bunch, this beam structure also like affects sure, the ability, you know, or uh, the, the influence of this, uh, of, of, of the, how we are able to trigger. And, you know, if there is like some effect from, uh, from, the, from the previous bunch, uh, bunch collision. Good, yeah. Okay, and the very last question. It's from Instagram. Are heavy ions what they are talking about in the Big Bang Theory song? Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> You're younger. I mean, than I, 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 I know the, I know the, I know the TV show. My problem is that the the intro song is like a so fast, and I'm not a native speaker that it's uh, yeah. it's hard to follow. Uh, so I don't know actually. I mean, I don't remember that part. But we, we we did we did get a a call out in Angels and Demons when they make a huh? comment that we hope the heavy iron guys don't screw this up. That's true. Yes, I said that part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also an atlas. Okay. Good. So, yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it was great, and thanks for the audience for the very nice questions and for being here until the end. Uh, and Peter and Martin. I wish you uh, the best, great, uh, the best uh, heavy iron run ever. The best of luck of this yeah. <laughs> for the new operation of the LHC. And yeah, thank you, everybody. Uh, it has been awesome to have you here. And ciao. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thanks for the questions. Bye.